All right, good morning, everyone. We are still waiting for a few to climb on, but we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Malia Noble, and I am a communicable disease epidemiologist for Spokane Regional Health District. I'd like to thank you all for attending this webinar today. We are very excited to be working with the National Ebola Training and Education Center, or NETEC, to provide this training to frontline medical facilities and public health in Eastern and Central Washington. We hope this training will provide an insight into how to be prepared in the event that a patient under investigation of Ebola or another special pathogen presents at your facility. The format for today's webinar will be as follows. Five videos will be shown. After each video, a panel of subject matter experts will host a brief Q&A session with a longer Q&A after the final video is shown. Please make sure the sound on your computer is on as you will only be able to hear the videos through your computer speakers. If you have any questions at any time, please feel free to type it into the question chat box and one of the panelists will answer it during the Q&A session. Instructions on how to obtain the continuing education credits will be provided at the end of the webinar. With that, panelists, could I have each of you introduce yourselves and then we will get started with the first video. Okay. Um, hi, Maria. Yes, um, everybody. I'm Kate Bolton. I'm the nurse manager for the Nebraska Biocontainment Unit. Um, in 2014, we, we did care for um, three confirmed Ebola patients. Um, so if you, you know, have any questions about that, then please let us know at the end of this um, session. Um, I'm going to let Shelly Sweethelm introduce herself now. Hi, everybody. Shelly Sweethelm, nurse leader here at Nebraska. And I have accountability for emergency management. And um, prior to our uh, patients that we cared for in 2014, I was also overseeing the emergency department at that time. So this is a subject near and dear to my heart and um, had a lot of experience in setting up our uh, process algorithm, et cetera, for that. And now um, have accountability for many of our grants related to education, training, research, and other things um, as it pertains to um, special pathogens. Okay. Um, Krista, would you like to introduce yourself now? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Krista Argonchona, and I am the coordinator for the Special Pathogens Unit at Providence Sacred Heart Medical Center, and we're the regional treatment facility for Region 10. And uh, I'm glad to be joining everybody today. And we have actually been working a lot this last year on this whole process within our uh, emergency department and kind of really revisiting and refining our processes. And we're going to do an exercise next week. So um, I'm happy to participate. Thank you. Amanda, would you say who you are? Sure. My name is Amanda Grendel. I run the biocontainment unit at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. We are Emory's regional pediatric partner for Region 4. So the two of us make up um, region, region 4's regional um, treatment center. Um, we actually just had our um, exercise last week. We did a pathogen X for respiratory. So happy to share um, experiences about changing up um, the infectious pathogen and looking forward to working with y'all today. Thank you. Okay, um, and then Alex. Thanks, Kate. Um, I'm Alex Isaacov. I'm an emergency medicine and EMS physician at Emory University. I'm the medical director for the Grady EMS uh, Emory University biosafety transport team. And I'm the NETEC lead uh, for the EMS work group focusing on um, safe uh, patient transport. Thanks. Okay, and then finally, but not least, um, Trish. Trish. Hi, everybody. My name is Trish Tennell, and I'm from Bellevue Hospital in Manhattan. Um, I'm the nurse lead and one of the trainers at our program, and also a new tech SME. Okay, wonderful. So, so um, Karen, I think we're ready to, to get started. Hello, and welcome to the NETEC Management of a Person Under Investigation module. My name is Kate Bolter, and I serve as a subject matter expert for the National Ebola Training and Education Center. 
Throughout this module, I will discuss the management of persons suspected to have Ebola and other special pathogens, and I will explain the tiered system that was developed as a national framework to coordinate a networked approach to mitigate disease transmission and activate resources within your state and FEMA region. After the completion of this module, learners will identify components within the processes of identifying, isolating, and informing of a person under investigation, and recognize and select resources used in the processes of identifying a person under investigation. Before we begin, I'd like to give you a little background on why we have a tiered system. In March of 2014, the World Health Organization announced that the Ebola outbreak in West Africa had reached epidemic proportions and recommended the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention put the United States emergency response infrastructure on alert. The CDC responded by disseminating information on the Ebola virus case definition. They also stressed a need for travel screening and provided recommendations for what personal protective equipment would be required in the care of persons suspected or confirmed to have Ebola virus disease. Then, in August of 2014, the nation and the world watched as the first American with Ebola virus disease was flown from West Africa and admitted to the Serious Communicable Diseases Unit at Emory University Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. This admission was done under controlled transportation procedures to a specially designed unit that had prepared for many years and was ready to treat and care for patients with diseases such as Ebola. Soon, more American citizens who contracted the Ebola virus were flown to Georgia and Nebraska, but on September 26, 2014, an individual infected with the Ebola virus although unaware that he was carrying the disease, traveled from West Africa to Texas. This traveler became symptomatic a few days after arrival and sought care at a Dallas hospital. A potential diagnosis of Ebola was not initially considered or recognized, and he was sent home only to return on September 28th by rescue squad, and his diagnosis of Ebola virus disease was confirmed during his admission on September 30th. This event, which could have occurred anywhere within the United States, led to two nurses being infected with the Ebola virus and sparked fear within the country that an Ebola outbreak was about to occur on U.S. soil. It also revealed gaps within the U.S. healthcare system, specifically that not all healthcare facilities were equipped with processes and workflows that would facilitate recognizing and managing a patient with Ebola and other special pathogens. The CDC responded by developing a three-tiered framework to guide healthcare facilities on how to prepare and respond in a coordinated and networked approach when faced with a patient suspected or known to have Ebola virus disease. Patients who are suspected to have the disease and are symptomatic are classified as persons under investigation, or PUIs as I will refer to them from now on. The model has been implemented in varying ways in state and territory health departments to identify healthcare facilities that would function in one of three capacities. These capacities are frontline healthcare facilities, Ebola assessment hospitals, and Ebola treatment centers. Each capacity was tasked with having the ability to identify a patient who presents with Ebola and other special pathogens, isolate them to prevent disease transmission and inform departments or appropriate individuals within their own facility as well as their local and state public health departments that they have identified a person suspected to have Ebola or other special pathogen at their facility. As each of these steps occurs, resources should be activated to support the entire process. In addition to the tasks of identifying, isolating, and informing, each capacity has varying levels of operation and length of time they must be prepared to provide care for PUIs or for patients who have been confirmed to have the disease. 
the capability requirements for each level on the tiered system are. For frontline healthcare facilities, which includes every acute healthcare institution in the United States. They must be prepared with appropriate resources to provide care for PUIs for up to 24 hours. Some of these resources include personal protective equipment, or PPE, and staff trained on the clinical care of PUIs and the transport of the PUI to an assessment hospital or treatment center. The Ebola assessment hospitals are required to provide care for PUIs for up to five days. This includes providing timely results on the following laboratory tests that will inform clinical decision making. CBC, sodium, potassium, bicarbonate, BUN, creatinine, glucose, liver function tests, PT and INR, urinalysis, blood culture for bacterial pathogens, malaria testing, and influenza virus testing during periods when influenza pre prevalence is high. In addition to identifying a PUI and providing care, Ebola assessment hospitals must be prepared to receive a patient from a frontline facility and conduct testing to rule in or rule out the disease. If the disease is confirmed, they must be prepared and know how they will transport a confirmed patient to a treatment center. Ebola treatment centers must be prepared to accept a confirmed patient and provide care for the entire duration of their illness. This includes having the same resources to provide the lab tests that are required for Ebola assessment hospitals and any other lab tests required to manage a patient with the Ebola or other special pathogen disease. Ebola treatment centers must also have enough PPE and trained staff on hand for seven days with the ability to restock supplies as required. Okay, um, so now, now we're going to open up for questions. So if anybody has a question, um, go ahead and um, Raise, raise your hand and then we'll get to answer the question. Can, can I, everybody hear me? Yeah, loud and clear, Kate. Yeah, can, can they, I wonder if the, the attendees are hearing me okay? Okay, I'm, go, I'm going to assume then that there, there's no questions and we can move on with the, the second video. I think we have a couple of poll questions we're going to ask before we proceed, if that's okay. Uh, sure, yes, that's definitely fine. Um, Karen, are you going to run the poll questions? Yeah. Okay, so the first uh, poll question for the attendees is to um, select uh, for which step in the process is your facility most prepared? Of the attendees would just select the answer that they feel is most appropriate.
Okay, so the answer is um, most people are saying that they're unsure. Um, they've got more, other people have got the informed process down. Okay, um, Karen, shall, come, shall we go on with the second video now? The first step in the process is to identify. The goal of this step is to quickly determine if a person who has entered your facility seeking medical treatment is a PUI. As such, this person who is potentially infected with Ebola or other special pathogen disease could pose a health risk to the hospital staff, other patients, visitors to the hospital, and the well-being of the community. A PUI is identified by the meeting one or more of the following. Presenting at your facility with the symptoms that reflect the clinical criteria that match the case definition for Ebola or other special pathogens. In the case of Ebola virus, it was having an elevated body temperature or subjective fever or symptoms, including severe headache, fatigue, muscle pain, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain or unexplained hemorrhage and an epidemiologic risk factor within the known incubation period for a specific pathogen. For example, the incubation period for Ebola is 21 days and Middle East Respiratory Syndrome is 14 days. Other epidemiologic risk factors include having traveled to an area where the disease is present, being in contact with someone who is known or suspected to have the disease, or having an exposure to the disease, such as as a result of a penetrating injury by a sharp instrument previously used on a person known to have the disease. Whatever the reason, if there is cause for the healthcare provider to suspect a patient is presenting with Ebola or other special pathogen disease, steps must be taken very quickly to mitigate its spread. Identifying a PUI can be challenging, as not every patient who presents with a fever and travel history will have the disease. For example, of the 25 travelers to Atlanta during the Ebola epidemic who required medical evaluations, only eight of them had symptoms that required testing for Ebola virus disease. All of them, however, were ruled out, but they were diagnosed with other conditions that required treatment, such as upper respiratory infections, traveler's diarrhea, malaria, pregnancy miscarriage, parasitic infections, and more. Another challenge is that patients differ in their healthcare seeking behavior due to cultural, social, economic, geographical, and organizational factors. So it is not improbable for someone to seek medical assistance where they identify as a provider of healthcare. As such, it may not be the emergency department of a well-equipped critical access hospital, which makes it important that all healthcare facilities be prepared for a patient arriving at their facility at any time with any of the special pathogen diseases. Frontline healthcare facilities include hospital-based emergency departments, critical access hospitals, and urgent care clinics. Although frontline healthcare facilities do not include primary care offices and other non-emergent ambulatory care settings, preparedness guidance for these settings is available on the CDC website. In addition to preparing for the arrival of a PUI, consideration must be given to the various ways a PUI can arrive at your facility. For example, he or she could walk in under his or her own efforts, be brought in by another person if unable to do it alone, if the PUI is a dependent child or adult in need of assistance. He or she could arrive by ambulance having been pre-identified as a PUI if screened through a 911 call or identified en route by EMS personnel. 
There is also the possibility that a PUI may be brought in by ambulance, but not identified as a PUI until after arrival at your facility. Another factor to take into consideration and prepare for is the physical condition of the PUI upon arrival. This may be non-emergent with only minor symptoms such as headache, mild cough, and low-grade fever. Emergent with more severe symptoms such as uncontrolled diarrhea and emesis or severe respiratory difficulty. The PUI could be in critical condition with organ failure and be in need of specialized or critical care processes such as dialysis or ventilation. Then there is a the possibility that a patient could be dead upon arrival if they expire during transportation. Facilities should prepare for all potential situations, but for the purposes of this education, we will assume the PUI is walking into a facility under his or her own efforts. All right, let's go ahead and take uh, one more poll question if the attendees don't mind answering. That, that's great. Um, so it looks like, you know, people have got um, their, their signage and their signs in place. Um, but what's really great is I, have, I see here that everybody's got their PPE available for visitors coming into their facilities. So um, I'm going to start off a little bit of a conversation. Um, and, and I hope that the um, participants can feel like you can join in. But I'm going to ask Shelley to maybe describe a little bit about how she prepared her emergency department for people coming in. Thanks, Kate. And I uh, actually would like to speak kind of on a broader uh, context. I think one thing that we learned, um, and I often say this as I speak to groups, that Dallas could have happened anywhere. And I think that kind of puts people at ease a little bit because honestly, in 2014, what happened in Dallas with the traveler um, presenting to the emergency room being sort of misdiagnosed and, and not clearly diagnosed uh, the first time um, certainly could have happened to any of us. So the whole country was scrambling to kind of figure out what were the ways to um, kind of protect their front doors and make sure that everything was handled correctly. I think we've learned an awful lot since then. And as we think about from an infectious disease perspective, not just with special pathogens, but the day-to-day -day things that we're challenged with, such as influenza, um, measles, chickenpox, all of the above that can easily um, create a situation where there's a tremendous amount of workload to really identify all of the contacts and then um, provide treatment if it's available, um, to monitor and track um, not just uh, healthcare workers, but visitors. So I think the whole country has gotten a lot better about really being mindful at the front door. So if this is something that you haven't Im impacted yet at your own organization, we would just really encourage you. We're looking for um, those symptoms. So upper respiratory, uh, fever, um, anything that might make you think, hmm, could this be something infectious? and then getting a mask on that person. Um, and again, like we just talked about in the video, 
really having ways, uh, some administrative controls perhaps that might help people to self-recognize um, that they should put a mask on or at the very least have a pretty assertive person at your front desk areas to hand the mask to the individual. Um, and then just really um, being mindful of then, do we think this is something more serious and uh, making sure that the rest of the caregivers down the line um, in the care process continuum um, have that information. So some work is being done with electronic healthcare records to um, help uh, facilitate uh, this uh, communication as well as action, but that's slow go. So for now, it's up to all of us to really work on that piece and part of it. The other thing I think I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes on, I think um, in some re regards, we get a little confused on occasion um, with the language. So we haven't really uh, talked too much yet in the videos about what's the difference between a person under investigation, somebody who's quarantined, or somebody who we've now got in isolation. So starting with kind of the person under investigation, the real definition, as Kate mentioned in the video uh, that was put together, is really somebody who meets that case definition from a symptom standpoint, as well as the travel standpoint. So now there's somebody who you've recognized has got symptoms, but, but you're concerned because of their travel as well. So that, that is becoming, I think, a little bit more objective for people to understand. And then um, quarantine, those are really not, those are not ill people. Um, they're not patients, they're people who perhaps traveled back to the um, community and are under close observation, such as what happened in 2014-15, when folks who were in the endemic areas where Ebola was um, present in Africa and came back um, to the United States, came through those six international airports and then were really um, coordinated through public health to get that twice daily temperature monitoring for the 21 days. And then of course, isolation, uh, we use both for persons under investigation to keep them segregated um, until either ruled out or ruled in. And then um, also then for confirmed illness, then they would move into a isolation status. So those were things that I think as I started to learn all about all of this, it was just important to be uh, reminded of as we um, talked definitions and kind of process. So I think that's all I would have to say for now. And if there's any questions, certainly happy to engage with anybody on those. Do any of the other panelists have anything to add to what shall we have to say? Okay, any questions from the participants? You know, okay. Kate, if we have a minute, I might just in, inject the uh, a, a trait, a patient transport element in the discussion now. Mm -hmm. That'd be perfect, Alex. Thank you. Sure. So, you know, my my thought is that if you're a frontline facility and you have um, measures in place to help identify an individual who's presenting with some signs and symptoms of illness, uh, and then also screening them for travel history. Uh, that, uh, you know, these days you might find someone who um, screens positive for travel history to the Saudi Arabia or the Arabian Peninsula and some febrile acute respiratory illness back in 2014-15 uh, when there was widespread Ebola transmission in West Africa, you might have someone screen positive for recent travel and um, fever, headache, or maybe some nausea. And as a frontline facility, um, Identifying the individual is important, obviously, so that they can be isolated from other visitors or unprotected staff. But I'm sure any frontline uh, healthcare facility then is, is thinking, okay, you know, how do I initiate this process to get the patient moved to an assessment center or a treatment center uh, so that your frontline facility can go back to its routine operations? And um, uh, part of that process, you know, once you're state health department or local and state health departments involved and uh, the uh, transportation uh, 
plan is initiated, um, you know, will be some need typically to interface with um, EMS personnel, probably from a designated agency uh, with uh, paramedics or out of hospital providers who've had the appropriate education and training and competencies to do the, the work. But from, a, from an, a frontline healthcare facility perspective, um, having some dialogue with those transport agencies in advance to sort of establish expectations, I think, you know, is important. The transport agency obviously will want to have direct communications with you to see, well, okay, where, where are we going to do the patient handoff? And uh, what will the patient, you know, be dressed uh, in? And uh, what is the patient's condition? They're interested in that because they want to plan for care of the patient during the transport, but also to ensure that whatever can be done to stabilize that patient and you know, prevent them uh, from uh, sharing infectious bodily fluids and putting the pre-hospital healthcare workers at risk has been done. And um, that might mean giving some medications in advance uh, to prevent nausea and vomiting, or it might mean uh, volume resuscitating that patient, even just simply with some saline or LR um, to uh, to correct any tachycardia or hypotension that might exist, um, and then um, you know, trans transfer of that patient to the to the to the transport agency so that they can move about getting that patient to the assessment or treatment center. But um, there are, are guidelines that uh, are posted um, on the CDC website about uh, you know, expectations, let's say, of a frontline healthcare facility in preparing that patient for transport that's probably uh, you know, worth a review for frontline healthcare facilities that might be participating in this webinar. And I don't know if that generates more questions, but I thought I would just put that out there. Um, thanks, Alex. I'm going to um, ask again if the participants have any questions that um, they'd like us to answer for them. Okay, hearing none, I'm going to go ahead and let Karen go ahead and uh, start the next video. Thank you. The process of identifying can occur in several ways. If there are tools in place to enable the person to self-identify, this process can begin prior to the PUI entering your facility. A PUI can self-identify as having the symptoms of exposure of concern if there are strategically placed signage directing them to report and take certain actions. For example, if the PUI has symptoms listed on the sign, they can be directed to perform hand hygiene and put on articles of personal protective equipment, such as gloves and face masks. If they have had recent travel to a place where the disease is present, they will also be asked to put on PPE and report that immediately to the reception desk. If they have had contact with persons known to have the disease, again, they will be directed to put on PPE and report that immediately to the reception desk. Since exposure to a disease occurs by either contact, droplet, or airborne transmission, providing PPE for the person to self-don will result in containing the disease at the source. The PPE must be readily available with clear and easy to understand instructions on how to put it on. Never assume that everyone knows how to put on PPE. Signs that direct a PUI's actions prior to them entering your facility can mitigate exposure at the reception desk and protect staff and other patients in the area. The signage should be strategically located in a prominent position to be easily seen, should be easy to understand with clear and easy to follow directions, contain information written in languages other than English, and should contain pictograms, which are an excellent universal language, so long as they are clear in delivering their message. However, 
If the person does not self-identify as a PUI, the task will fall to the greeter or triage nurse or clerk who registers the patient upon arrival. Having a standardized process to screen every person who seeks care at your facility will facilitate and direct this process. The use of algorithms that provide step-by-step, easy-to-follow instructions and decision-making flowcharts will facilitate standardizing this process. The algorithm should be developed in a way that reflects the unique processes at your facility. There are several available as resources that can be edited to fit your needs. The CDC provides this general example for emergency department evaluation and management of persons under investigation for Ebola virus disease. As you can see, it provides process steps with questions to ask and information to guide decisions and next steps. Or for diseases other than Ebola, this is an example of a symptom-driven algorithm that is used to identify patients with infectious conditions. Or this one that is facility specific for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or MERS-CoV is a good example of how an algorithm can direct the decision-making process as well as prompt staff on determining roles, what the next steps are, and it has all the important contact information at hand. The algorithm will be implemented by all staff members involved in the care of the PUI, beginning with the greeter who will ask the initial screening questions, Follow the steps indicated on the algorithm. Screening can be done via the electronic health record by building it into your system, or for a more work intense process would be to have it printed and fill in the answers by hand. However they are implemented, the following information should be addressed. Has the patient traveled within the non-incubation period to a place where Ebola or other special pathogen is present? Or, have they been in contact with a person known to have the disease? Or, do they have signs and symptoms in addition to a positive travel history and or contact with a person confirmed to have the disease? If the algorithm indicates the patient is at risk for having Ebola or other special pathogen, immediate steps must be taken to mitigate disease transmission. Because of the nature of emerging infectious diseases and disease outbreaks, screening for just one disease will likely miss important information that would identify another. Therefore, it is important to be aware of what the current threat is, and this makes it important to know who, what, and where your resources are, and how to find the most current information. A resource readily available to you is the Infection Prevention Department at your own facility, as well as your local and state health departments. Each is staffed with professionals who maintain knowledge on outbreaks that are currently being reported internationally. Other resources are the CDC Current Outbreak List, the World Health Organization Disease Outbreak News, and the CDC's Health Alert Network. The HAN is particularly useful as you can sign up to receive notifications. Once a person screens positive, meaning he or she has the exposure history and symptoms of Ebola or other special pathogen, they are a PUI and should be cared for following protocols and procedures aimed at preventing disease transmission and protecting the well-being of staff other patients and visitors at your facility. Okay, so we're going to put up another poll question and then um, we'll do the poll and then we'll um, take questions again. 
So does your facility use a screening algorithm for infectious conditions? Um, if yes, um, select that answer. No, um, if it's under development or no, previously used during relevant outbreak or if, if you're unaware, uh, select I don't know. That's excellent. Everybody's um, doing that, so wonderful. So um, I'm going to open this up there right now to uh, the panelists. If you have anything to say about any of your experience or uh, any recommendations that you might want to give. Okay. Um, any questions from participants or anything that you've been doing at your facilities that you would like to share with us? Okay, we'll go back to, we'll go on with the, um, the next video. Thanks, Karen. The purpose of isolating a PUI is to prevent the potential spread of a disease to staff, other patients and visitors at your facility. The selection and location of the isolation room requires careful consideration on how workflows related to the care of the PUI can be performed with a high degree of infection control, including how the PUI will be transferred from the point of entry to the isolation room itself. This will be unique to each institution and should be determined in consultation with infection control professionals who are familiar with your facility. Once the PUI is in isolation, necessary and appropriate care tasks and actions to not only confirm or rule out the disease, but also provide care and treatment for the PUI's presenting condition must be carried out safely and with a high level of infection control. Preparations can be made following the principles of the hierarchy of infection control, which are elimination, substitution, engineering controls, administrative, and PPE. Elimination involves removing hazards such as unnecessary equipment or reducing the amount of personnel who enter the room. Substitution involves finding a replacement for required processes, such as a system for communicating into and out of the room that is HIPAA compliant and allows for provider to provider communication to reduce the transmission risk by not having providers enter the isolation room if at all possible. Provider to PUI communication to allow the PUI to communicate with his or her providers without the risk of transmission. And PUI to family and significant others to lessen the negative psychological effects of being isolated. Communication substitutes include using a video conferencing system on a workstation on wheels in the patient room, using the patient call light system, or simply using whiteboards and paper and pens to communicate via windows. Avoid using the room telephone as a means of professional communication as there is a potential for it to dislodge PPE if it is a handheld device and it could result in fomite contamination, especially if the PUI is going to use it. Substitution controls also include the use of safe medical devices such as needleless IV systems that make it safer for staff by reducing the risk of a needle stick injury and PPE that meets the requirements set by the CDC. 
engineering controls are aimed at isolating the PUI to protect others and includes the selection and location of the isolation room in which care will be delivered. The use of airborne infection isolation rooms will mitigate the spread of infection from airborne generating procedures or airborne transmissible diseases. The room should be accessible without having to go through other patient care areas. And if possible, there should be a unidirectional flow for staff to enter and leave the isolation area. Ideally, the isolation room should be single occupancy with a private toilet or bedside commode. There must be a plan in place on how solid and liquid waste will be managed. This may include a room adjacent to the isolation room to sequester solid waste until the disease status is known. The room should be minimally furnished and to reduce the amount of surface decontamination that will be required if the PUI is confirmed to have the disease. The furnishings in the PUI room should be non-porous, easily cleaned, and there should be a predetermined cleaning process. Developing a cleaning checklist for routine and terminal cleaning can be a useful tool to ensure that all surfaces are cleaned or decontaminated. The room should be stocked and prepared with only dedicated and necessary equipment and supplies, as this will avoid wasting supplies or having equipment placed out of service until a diagnosis is made or the patient is discharged. Engineering controls also include establishing work zones throughout the unit to indicate the level of risk in those areas. For example, the green or cold zone is an area where there is no risk for disease transmission. This area will never be exposed to a contaminated item or person. The yellow or warm zone is an area where certain tasks may be conducted, such as the removal of PPE and the transferring of waste from this isolation room to the red zone for processing. Although there will be measures put in place to avoid environmental exposure, there is a potential for inadvertent fomite contamination, so care must be taken to avoid unprotected contact with any item or person in this zone. The red or hot zone is the isolation room where the patient care is provided. There must never be any unprotected contact with any item or person in this zone. Administrative controls involve the way work is performed within the unit and includes developing policies and procedures that direct workflow processes such as algorithms, the management, training and scheduling of staff, the actions that are permitted or prohibited in the work zones, instructions on how to obtain and process lab specimens, the management of waste from the isolation room or unit into the waste stream. Administrative controls also includes maintaining a record of all staff who enter the isolation room, as they will be required to monitor and document their lack or presence of signs and symptoms consistent with the clinical definition of the disease if the PUI is rolled in. PPE, although described as the least effective component on the hierarchy, is vitally important in the care of patients suspected or confirmed to have Ebola or other special pathogen disease. Staff caring for a PUI or confirmed patient must have prior training and demonstrated competency in critical tasks such as donning and doffing PPE and wearing the PPE while performing critical skills such as specimen collection and waste handling. Okay, thank you. So, um, Karen, can I have you put up the, the call, call question? Thank you. Um, so, uh, for participants only, um, which principle in the hierarchy of control presents the biggest challenge or, or that you see as the biggest challenge at your facility? Is it elimination, substitution, engineering, administrative, or PPE? 
and we'll give you a minute to answer. Okay, so it looks like um, elimination and then uh, engineering. You know? So I'm, I'm thinking probably, you know, that your, your workspaces. Um, Malia, um, I think um, you had a question to ask the participants. So I will let you go ahead now. Yeah, we had a, a question come through for the, um, the panelists. Um, the, the isolation process is quite intimidating, especially for a small rural facility like we have with very limited staff and resources. So what suggestions as you guys as experts who've actually handled PUI um, might you have that we can better prepare um, and feel more confident if, if we ever have a PUI present at our facility? Well, this is Shelley, um, Sweet Home. And I think, you know, your point is very well taken and we've actually had the opportunity to engage within our own regions, um, small frontline community hospitals. So I think it's a matter of just deciding um, and it may, may need to be a hospital wide um, decision. So the best space for somebody who needs to be isolated may not be in your two, um, uh, bay emergency room. It may be somewhere else in your hospital. It may be in a clinic setting or um, just anywhere else that you think would at least get the person kind of segregated from anyone else. Um, so I think that kind of goes back to just being really creative with your um, team members in your organization to really define what does that look like. And then if you're unable to find a private room anywhere, obviously just uh, spatial separation is key. And then making sure that you put in place the kind of guardrails or your way of um, managing things so that you don't have cross um, contamination of caregiver or um, to the other patients. So in many cases, what we've seen is, is um, the place selected is not in the emergency room at these small hospitals, it's it's elsewhere in their organization. And any of the other participants or the panelists have any uh, suggestions to offer? This is Alex. I don't know if this helps, but you know, we, we've talked about um, Persons under investigation or PUIs, you know, like they're all the same, uh, but but everyone on the call knows that they're not. Um, so, you know, once a person that presents to your frontline healthcare facility is identified as, you know, having a travel history of concern and some signs and symptoms, you know, they're they should be immediately, you know, isolated, put away from other visitors, other patients staff that aren't wearing an appropriate you know PPE ensemble until until someone can do a more detailed um, you know I guess questioning of the patient around you know what kind of exposure they may have had so even if you go back to you know Ebola 2014 2015 you know a patient might come back from a country with widespread Ebola transmission and present with fever and so they they become you know provided they came or returned from that country within the last 21 days now present at your frontline healthcare facility with fever they're immediately a PUI so they would be isolated somewhere but you know what would immediately follow is, is some knowledgeable person whether that's somebody from infection uh, from an infectious disease at the hospital or a public health epi person is going to start to you know be called in to ask them questions. Um, about, well, what's the real risk of their exposure? You know, were they just in a hotel room in uh, that 
country with the widespread Ebola virus disease with no you know, personal contact, no patient contact, nothing, or were they a healthcare worker, they got stuck with a dirty needle. They're both PUIs, but one is a high risk PUI, one is a you know, low to you know, almost no risk PUI. And, and having an understanding even of that, what the real risk is that the PUI you know, has the disease, like what was their exposure history, is a, you know, potentially a big relief to the staff at the frontline healthcare facility, um, you know, about how they engage with that patient. It's not to say they should break good infection control practice. It just, you know, believe me, in practice will be a big relief if this is a very low risk PUI. Yes, you need to implement, you know, uh, the engineering and, uh, and controls and policies and procedures and apply the right PPE based on whatever standard and transmission based precaution is, is um, recommended. But I think, you know, knowing that that not all P PUIs are created equal and, and that there's a risk stratification among PUIs is probably helpful too, um, as you consider, you know, how you're going to manage that patient after arrival and and then depending on what the risk is you know how you're going to manage that that patient in the next uh, day or two or until you can have them transported out i don't know if any of the other panelists uh, want to weigh in on on that perspective or if anyone on the call wants to just react as to whether or not that's helpful yeah let's it's shelly and i i do think it's helpful but i think the bigger challenge for some of these smaller critical access hospitals is who helps me discern um, the risk stratification um, at that moment in time at 2 a.m. Um, or whatever. So I think, you know, a bit of advice or thoughts for um, folks might be to really um, establish a close partnership with your health department at the local level in your county, um, particularly so that you have a resource to be able to engage. Um, most organizations, regardless of size, do have someone um, beyond their emergency department to be able to connect with. Um, but even then, um, that person may not be a, a specialist in infectious disease. So they'll too need to then engage with others well outside of their organization to really understand and risk stratify. So um, a bit of advice would be to just really uh, collaborate closely and, and get some names so that you actually have that person who would be your go-to at two in the morning um, to really collaborate with from the health department perspective to help you kind of move beyond um, the situation a little bit and, and try to discern a little bit more. So that'd be all I would add to that. And this is Amanda. Um, Adding on to what Shelley and um, Alex have said is just um, resources. You may have your own resources in a limited standpoint, but that's just um, for your facility. So remember that there's people all around. So whether that's your health department or for special populations, for instance, what if a pediatric patient walks into your facility? Do you know um, kind of who your partner is um, with that? Um, also, when we're talking about making your policies and procedures around your unit and kind of what you're going to do. Um, always try to keep in mind that anybody can walk into your facility, whether um, any age. Um, so just kind of having in mind what you're gonna do if it is a pediatric patient um, or some type of patient that you're not used to taking care of. So kind of things to think about would be, um, what are you gonna do with the family members? Because at that point, if the um, pediatric patient is a PUI, probably some of the adults that are with the pediatric patient are gonna be PUIs um, or confirmed cases down the road. Um, kind of what if the mom, what if it's a baby and the mom is breastfeeding? Um, kind of how are you gonna handle visitors? Um, and just really kind of keeping a pediatric patient um, to keep their mask on for her. For, to just start with something simple. So there's lots of things you can think about ahead of time to try to um, make sure that you are as prepared as you can be um, before those kind of issues come up and that patient presents to your front door. But again, just reiterating, learning who your resources are and what they are and kind of where they are ahead of time will really help you be able to mitigate those risks and know who to contact. Okay. Thank, well, thanks, Shelley, Alex, and uh, Amanda. That's very helpful. Um, and it, 
Any questions from the participants? Okay, I am going to um, have Karen go ahead and start the final video. As the PUI is identified and isolated, the process of INFORM occurs simultaneously and is designed to guide and support the next steps by activating resources. For example, at the point of entry, the clerk will inform the charge or triage nurse when a PUI is identified. This person will inform the unit manager and initiate isolation. This step will involve assigning a care team who are trained in all aspects of PUI management to assume the care of this patient. Although each facility will need to develop their own unique informed process, it typically involves developing a method with the following steps. The clerk informs a charge or triage nurse. The charge or triage nurse informs the unit manager and the infection control department. The manager informs hospital administration and the local health department. The local health department informs the state health department. Once the information reaches the state health department, the state health department representative, in consultation with the physician caring for the PUI, will authorize laboratory testing and call in state resources such as the public health lab personnel. It is advised that a list of important phone numbers be kept in an accessible location and include job titles, not just names, as people can change positions. If possible, have more than one way of contacting critical persons as work numbers are only good during working hours. The INFORM process will activate your state's concept of operations or CONOPS and initiate the process of testing and then transporting the PUI, if appropriate, to a higher level of care. For example, if the PUI presents at a frontline facility, transportation may be required to transfer them to an assessment hospital for testing. If the PUI becomes a confirmed patient, transportation will be coordinated to transfer him or her to a treatment center. This module discussed the three-tiered framework developed by the CDC to provide a coordinated effort to identify, isolate, inform, and care for patients with Ebola or other special pathogen disease. It requires all US healthcare facilities to function in one or more of three capacities. These capacities are frontline healthcare facilities, Ebola assessment hospitals, and Ebola treatment centers. Each capacity has its own requirements and length of period to which they must be able to provide care to either a PUI or a confirmed patient. But all three things they must be able to provide is the ability to identify when a patient with Ebola or other special pathogen disease presents at their facility for care, isolate that person to protect staff, other patients and visitors from the disease, and they must all inform the necessary individuals who will activate resources to facilitate a coordinated and networked approach towards the care of the patient. Thank you for your participation in this module. Okay, everybody. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and um, open the poll up again uh, and, and ask this question. So has your facility participated in a drill of your state's CONOPS? Um, yes, no, or unsure if you're, you don't know what the CONOPS is.
Okay, that's excellent. So 50% um, of you have um, participated in a drill, 25% um, no and 25% unsure. That's really good. So um, um, Malia, I believe you have another question. We do have another question. So um, what suggestions might you have for increasing communications between us as a facility and our partners? So public health, EMS, um, partners like that to possibly conduct exercises, but so we know that we're ready. Malia, this is Shelly Sweet Home again, and I, I uh, happen to also um, have a strong relationship with our local healthcare coalition. So hopefully someone from your organization, maybe your um, emergency preparedness person, or safety person, or um, it just kind of depends on small hospitals who that person is, but hopefully they can um, somehow connect within the coalition within your community, um, because what um, there are there in the coalition requirements now, the hospital preparedness capabilities, the coalitions are accountable to have several stakeholders at the table. So EMS, emergency management, public health, and health care. So with those four groups now being required to be at the table for healthcare coalitions, that makes that the perfect venue to really develop relationships and to partner, and there are exercise requirements for the, the coalition as well. So that would be one strong suggestion that I would have to offer um, for a way to kind of get in, get in the loop on um, what's happening within your community and your environment and that collaboration that could yield, you know, involvement in drills, etc. Okay, do any of the other panelists have anything to add? Okay. Yeah, this is Alex. I mean, I think with regards to the EMS community, um, there's probably any number of ways an assessment center, you know, would identify who the likely EMS agency was that would uh, bring a patient or come and take a patient from that frontline healthcare facility to another facility assessment or treatment. Um, and, uh, and one place I, you know, that you could go to, of course, if you're in a state uh, public health office or, or, uh, or state EMS office to just have, if you don't already know, just to have some idea about how the state uh, manages the transport of uh, PUIs or confirmed cases. They may have a designated team or uh, several designated teams around the state, you know, and there may be one that's um, uh, just more geographically logical that would be interacting with your facility um, that would be moving a, a PUI or a confirmed case. And so that would be certainly one way um, to do that. Um, and, and a good way too, because once you identify who your partner is, then you can just start a dialogue with them to, uh, you know, to work out some of the operational details about where that uh, agency would, uh, how they would communicate with you if, if there was need for transport of a patient, where the patient handoff would take place, um, what the expectations are around, you know, the packaging of the patient or management of the patient in advance of the ambulance arriving. Um, etc. Um, and uh, uh, and then you know by developing that relationship, then maybe I, identifying an opportunity to either do a you know a small uh, well it could start with a tabletop you know discussion or tabletop exercise, and then move on to something more functional or or full scale, or even just drill one element of the you know entire uh, plan just to see how that element would go. Uh, but that that's a way that. Uh, I would think you could identify who your EMS partner is, is, is talk to your local or state health health department about the infectious disease transport plan in your state. Uh, this is Kristen Spokane. Can everybody hear me? Yes, I can. I, I, I know I can hear you. I'm hoping the participants are hearing you well, too. Okay, great. I, sorry, I've been having some technical difficulties on my end here. Um, we have spent uh, a lot of time collaborating with our community partners at Spokane Regional Health District 
and in other um, areas within our region in uh, Idaho and in other parts of Washington and in Alaska. And we've done it in a, in a multitude of different ways versus um, I've done quite a few um, presentations at different healthcare coalitions, which has really allowed for great conversations about how, how our concept of operation works and really how would you get a patient from anywhere in our region to, our, to the regional treatment facility. Uh, we've done quite a few tabletops and um, and then exercise, full-scale exercises, but uh, and also just engaged in a lot of conversations with um, Malia and our other partners at the Spokane Regional Health District to really iron out what our processes would be, what their processes would be, and so I just can't emphasize enough the value in um, discussions and in exercises with your public health partners to really figure out how that process is going to work. Thanks, Krista. Do any of the panelists have any um, experiences of, of working with your partners that you would want to talk about? This is Amanda. I would just add that it's invaluable even to just get names and then be familiar with your face. Um, so even though some of us are talking about full-scale exercises and that might be intimidating to you, um, something like a tabletop where you just get around and discuss things or even just a one-on-one -on -one meeting with certain people that are key players really just helps form a level of um, trust and communication that's really invaluable if and when something does occur. So while you may be worried about resources or again a full-scale exercise that we um, talk about might be really intimidating um, don't have to wait for something like that just reach out um, and kind of let them know who you are and learn who they are yeah yeah i couldn't agree more with you amanda uh, i think through the years um through all the preparing that we've done you know it hasn't always been big events that we've done with our partners um, sometimes it's just been, you know, just a, a meet and greet, and, and that's been just as valuable as um, our big exercises that we've had. Um, even, you know, things like, you know, I remember when we got our isopod, um, if any of you have isopods, I don't know what that is, it's a, a portable isolation unit that you, you can transport patients in. Um, you know, just having the EMS people or, or um, Omaha Fire Department bring their ambulance to the hospital just to make sure it fits in. You know, it wasn't a, a big event. It was just bring the ambulance, let's make sure the um, isopod fits. And it really helps to start forming those collaborations and getting to know each other and, um, and, and what each other's capable of doing. So, okay. Um, participants, um, is, is there anything that we can help you with right now? Um, any question that you have about any of the process? Okay, um, I'm not hearing any any question any questions from you right now. Um, but what I would uh, I'd like to remind you is that NeTech is here for um, here for you. If you go to NeTech.org. Um, there's lots of links and one very important link um, if you scroll down on that first page is you know ask a question um, and that's where you can ask a question that um, a subject matter expert will definitely get back to you um, we hope you know we say within two weeks um, but definitely before that um, there, there will be a, a, an evaluation um, that will be posted um, for you to fill in, for you to be able to get your CEUs for this presentation. Um, but I am going to hand it over to Malia now, um, your regional representative, to you know make a closing statement, if that's okay, Malia. Thanks, Kate. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you all again for attending today. Um, if you have any questions, you can uh, reach out to either myself or um, submit a question directly to NETEC, like Kate said, via their website. Um, Thanks again, and we hope you guys all have a wonderful day. Thanks, Malia, and, and I would like to second that, that, you know, I wish everybody a, a very great day. I hope your weather is wonderful there and that um, the cold has gone and summer can come in. All right, well, thank you.
And um, Karen, I'll let you go ahead and send out that link for the evaluation now.